I should have mentioned we talked about the Duraces this past week. They're doing well. Ah, the Duraces. Duraces in Florida are doing well. Yeah. Paul, Paul says. All right, so we are in Hebrews 13. <coughs> And I should take attendance today just so I can start the year off right with like the biggest Sunday school class I've ever had. Um, but uh, so last time we had people join us, we were still in Hebrews, but we just have, we have two weeks left uh, in Hebrews this week and next week. And then and debating whether or not to do kind of a review since we've been in the book of Hebrews for something like 16 months. Um, like that. So that's where we're going to start. So Hebrews 13, uh, we're going to cover verses 17 through 19 today. And to give us a little context in Hebrews 13. Um, so Hebrews 13 is often considered to be... Um, Kind of a random last chapter. It's kind of thought, it, some people actually think that it's not part of the original letter, uh, but we looked at that, that there's a lot of coherence between chapter 13 and the rest of the letter. Um, we also looked at how that there's a unifying theme through uh, verses 1 through 6. That unifying theme is, is the proper way of loving. Uh, and so uh, that the author of Hebrews um, works that out in various ways. And then verse 7 through verse 19 also is unified around the word uh, leaders. Remember your leaders. It says in verse 7 and in 17 it says obey your leaders. So we'll read verses 17 through 19 and um, talk about... Uh, what this means and what this means to us. Uh, verse 17, the author of Hebrews says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will, who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. So we want to finish uh, this section, verses 7 through 19 today, and talking about these leaders. Now, I had argued in verse 7, but since a lot of you weren't here when we talked about verse 7, I'll go ahead and repeat it. Uh, the word leaders in some translations is actually the word rulers. And the kind of rulers that we're talking about here are not secular rulers, but spiritual rulers. Uh, so in verse 7, it says, Remember your, your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Okay, so we're talking about those who spoke the word of God to these people. Uh, in verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. So again, this is your, our spiritual leaders, uh, that is our pastors, not uh, secular government. Secular government is not looking out, watching out for our souls. They are not teaching us the word of God. Okay, so we're talking about pastors. In verse 7, it's in, in the past tense, and so some think that that's the author think, saying to remember those who have in the past preached the word of God to you but are no longer around. Perhaps they've passed away. Uh, but previous pastors. Uh, remember how they taught you the word of God. Remember how they lived their lives out in front of you as good, uh, as good Christians. They finished the, the race that chapter 12 talks about and behave like them. Be like those people that went ahead before you. In verse 17, it's in the present tense. So some people consider this your current rulers. And I warned Pastor that we would be talking about him today in the third person. So hopefully he, hopefully we, hopefully we see him taking lots of notes. Uh, no, just kidding. <laughs> well, it's not Facebook. <laughs> oh. um. All right, so we, the congregation, are given the commands 
to obey our, our rulers, our leaders, uh, our spiritual leaders, and submit to them. Uh, this is a command that we are given, and, and the more generations go on, the harder it is for, for some people to, to do this, um, to obey their, their leaders and submit to them. And the reason we're supposed to do this is that they are keeping watch over our souls as those who will have to give an account. And you can look at 1 Corinthians 3 uh, also on this point, uh, and perhaps even Ephesians 4. But the pastors of churches will have a special judgment, if we can say that, with the Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd, as to how they ministered to God's people, to Christ's flock. So they will give an account as to how they ministered. Now, I'm sure there'll be some leniency for who they had to minister to, to whom they had to minister. Um, well, and we would hope that Christ would take that into account. But the way in which they, they minister, they're watching out for our souls. Uh, they have to give an account for that. And then notice the next statement. It says, let them, let these uh, rulers do this. Okay, the keeping watch over our souls. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. Okay, so here's, here's kind of the picture. Imagine that your pastor is praying for you. He's going through the prayer list. He's going through the church directory. And he's praying for you by name. What kind of emotions does that draw out for him? Okay. Is, is his remembrance of you with joy? Uh, or is it with groanings? Now, now we, we chuckle at this, but this is, really, this is really what the passage is talking about. Um, and I've used this analogy before. But I'll use it again. There, there's the shepherd, the pastor, you know, another, the word pastor means shepherd. So another, you know, ruler, pastor, bishop, elder, they're all the same per, you know, office in the New Testament. When the pastor looks out over the congregation, when the pastor thinks of the congregation, when he thinks of, of each one of us individually, the pastor is looking at us not necessarily how we are doing physically, or financially, or those types of things. He's looking at us spiritually. He's looking for the spiritual threats to our lives, the spiritual threats to the church. And that's why I, I use the analogy. I mean, our pulpit is raised so that you know we can see him. That's a practical thing. But there's a vantage point when you're standing up front and you're preaching out over a congregation because you can see everything. You know, there's no, there's really no hiding anything. But there's a sense in which a pastor has a spiritual advantage point when he looks out over the congregation, when he looks at each of us individually. And that care for our souls, which we may or may not always see, um, but that care for our souls that he uh, exercises over us, we, in turn, would like that to be a joyful exercise. And you can talk about the analogy of the sheep all the more. You know, because the, the sheep that come when he calls, those, the obedient sheep, um, those are the ones that, you know, he rejoices over. But when he has to go out after the one, and he's got to take a stick with him, you know, to corral the one that keeps getting caught up in the, in the, the thorns and the thistles. How many times did I have to tell you this? How many times do I have to remind you of these things? But I have to keep going out over and over and over again. Yeah, there is, we can honestly say, probably some groaning. Now, we won't ask pastor for any names. But, uh, but this is a real uh, injunction to us. Now, we've mentioned before uh, a little bit, and I thought I'll start out with a question. When you think of pastoral ministry, okay, what should a pastor be doing in ministry? What comes to your mind? This is where you, get, you can answer this. Okay, preaching the word. So preaching. Edification. 
Edification? So building up. What does a pastor do? Pray. Okay, he prays. Studies. He studies. Okay. Yep, studying for a sermon, studying in school, hopefully. <laughs> uh, Nelly. Okay. Yep, he corrects. It's a personal thing. Annoying your sheep. Annoying your sheep? Or knowing your sheep? <laughs> Okay, that is a very practical thing. What other uh, what other practical things? Not that these weren't practical, Joseph. Well, this isn't necessarily necessary for program directing. Okay, program directing. When we think of what pastors do. Yep, there's oversight. Loving a sheep. Okay, loving a sheep. So has, uh, I don't know, has the pastor ever visited someone when they were in the hospital? Like maybe you were going to have surgery and pastor came. Okay. What does the pastor do when he comes? He prays. Okay. Why is he doing that? He's caring for your soul. He's encouraging you. Okay. He's caring for your soul. He's encouraging you. He's pointing you in a certain direction. Right? So there's a, there's a famous painting that uh, it's called The Death of the Miser. Um, where there's this rich man who's dying. At the end of his, he's, he's, his room is very richly decorated. At the foot of his bed is a trunk full of money that's open. And death, the, you know, the caped guy with the sickle, he's coming in the door, the bedroom door, to the rich man. And there's an angel who's trying to get the rich man's attention, and he's pointing at a cross that's hanging on the wall. He's like, death is coming. You know, what, what have you gained? You've gained the whole world, but you've lost your own soul. And he's trying to point him in the right direction. He's trying to point him to Christ. Focus on Christ. Death is here. You're not going to stop death from, from doing what death has come to do. So, uh, so what are you going to do? And a lot of times, that's what our pastor is doing. He's simply reminding us of the biblical truth that hopefully we already know. Whether he's edifying us or encouraging us, uh, whether he is uh, correcting us, uh, the point is his ministry is, is through the word. Now, I think it's interesting, I think it was Lois he pointed out, or somebody pointed out, uh, he studies. So if we said, what do you pay your pastor to do? How many of you would think we pay our pastor to study? Like, we pay our pastor to read. <laughs> right? But we do. This is really important. Because if he's going to take the word of God and apply it to our lives in all of these various settings, he, he has to know it. He has to be good at it. Right? First uh, Timothy 5. I've mentioned that before. And if he's really good at it, then we pay him more. Uh, but it's easy to have the mindset of we pay our pastor to be busy. Have you ever thought about the fact that you have to pay your pastor to think? <laughs> I told you we're going to talk about you in here. I don't know how, how's that working out for you? I'm restraining myself. <laughs> yeah, don't spit, don't spit your, I'm going to stand over here so he doesn't spit his key out on me. All right. Uh, yeah, we actually have to pay our, we, so, and here's, here's why. How many, well, okay, so besides all of us who are retired, uh, but when you're not retired, how much time do you have to spend each day uh, for yourself studying the Word of God? See, we're burdened down more so by the cares of this world. So God has given us pastors, people that we can set aside 
to say, we need you to do this for us. So that we, we, you can lead us, you can guide us in these matters. When we, want, when we need counseling, we should be able to go to our pastor and, and as an editorial, I would say, if you need counseling in anything, you should be talking to your pastor. Uh, if, if, even if you're talking with other people, your pastor should be someone you're going to for counsel. And what is he going to do? He's going to open the word of God and, and apply the scriptures to the situation that you find yourself in life. But... Um, but the, 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 the fact that he can, we're, we're letting him do that. We're trying to remove the other distractions of life so that he can concentrate on those things. And yes, there are pastors who work, um, but uh, that's not something that uh, is ideal, obviously, um, that the pastor should be able to give himself full time to the ministry. Now, the pastor also happens to be a husband, uh, and a father, oh, oh there's a lady who's over here. Uh, and so he has to have time to be a husband and a father as well. So this is where, you know, you often see, well, what are, the, what are all the requirements for a pastor? We want to call a new pastor. Well, we want a pastor who works, you know, 80 hours a week. Um, and, uh, and, and and runs all of these programs and is too busy to study and uh, visits everyone in the nursing home and, and all of these things and we make him so busy that he also doesn't have time to be a husband uh, or a father, which is part of his calling as well. And that goes back to verse 7, uh, verses 7 um, in Hebrews 13. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So our leaders, our, our spiritual leaders, our pastors, are people that we need to obey and submit to um, for, for this reason, that they are watching out over our souls. Uh, because they have to do an account, uh, give an account for that. And we want them to be able to do that with joy and not with groaning. Um, for that would be of no advantage to you. And some of us have also been children, some more recently than others. Uh, but some of us maybe have children as well, and you can also think of it that way, probably very similarly, when you're raising your own kids. Um, yes, do it. Make a comment. A previous pastor that we had, um, never ever visited somebody who was um, unable to come and was sick and whatever. And it left a really, really poor testimony to the unsafe family. And in her request for her own funeral, uh, this person said, I do not want so-and-so to do my funeral. It was just a very blatant, really poor testimony for our church, I thought. Um, anyway, I, I, I'm just going to add that. Sure. That there has to be some balance, you know. Well, there's always, yeah, there's always, so the, the illustration that uh, Joanne was giving was pastors who uh, it's easy for any for any pastor to um, be so emphasized on one area of ministry that another one lacks right so there's always trying to find the balance uh, the pastors the the principle I think maybe we can put it this way is the pastor's ministry is a ministry of the word and this is First uh, Timothy three four and five we've looked at that before Hebrews thirteen seven which I just read a moment ago so we think of pastoral ministry whatever the pastor should be doing is a ministry really of the word um, but having said that uh, when someone is sick in the hospital. What does the pastor do? Pastor visits them, caring for their soul, to do what? Read the scriptures and pray with them. That's, you know, no, we can do that too. We had an elderly lady who was um, in the 
process of, uh, she'd been basically put on hospice, and a number of people would go uh, from the church to sit and spend time and just read scripture to her, but she wasn't really responsive by that point in time. Uh, but that is caring for, traditionally, that is caring for the souls uh, of the people. That you would not, um, you would not, a church body, especially the, the pastor, would not allow something like that to happen. Um, but yes, there's, there's always balance, and there's always things in the world that, that uh, are unusual, that, um, you know, can fluster somebody. Oh, well, I meant actually a pastor should not have to go any more than any other person in the church. Mm -hmm. So the, it's all our responsibility. Right. So the the person. So our expectations of our pastor have to be realistic. Is that what yeah. you're saying? Yeah. So that we're not putting undue burden on the pastor. And I would agree with that as well. Now, because in, in the book of Hebrews, how many times have we read that it's our responsibility as a congregation to uh, challenge one another, to encourage one another in the faith, to keep going in, in the faith, to correct us when we start to, to err off the path. And a lot of those have been injunctions to the church body. Um, but we, we also see that it's a responsibility of the pastor, and the pastor has a kind of a special uh, place in that, um, in that process. So, yes, I would, I would agree. Um, if, I look, if I ask the question this way, and I think we have time, if I ask the question this way, um, thinking of... And I suppose you could think of your current pastor as well, or other pastors that you've had. When you say this was this man was a good pastor, and I really appreciated X about his ministry, what would you what would you say? <laughs> well, let me say from uh, verse seven, it's a lot of example. Okay. So by their example, the way they lived their lives, it was a godly example. And you can point to that, you can remember that. And Paul was a pastor's kid. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the ones that stick out the most to me are the ones um, that had the most love, a noticeable love and concern for the sheep. For those who had noticeable love and concern for the sheep. Stands up. I think of a <clears throat> pastor that I had growing up, Max Day, uh, Western Road Baptist Church. And what I think of his ministry there, uh, he was stable and consistent in his elevation of God's word as the way to live. Um, that's kind of one of the example that was already mentioned, but um, he is such an excellent example of that. Uh, I, I really appreciate that. <laughs> I had a pastor who actually had me move in with him and his family. So I don't know if you've ever heard pastors say that, you know. Well, imagine someone came and lived with you. You know, what, what would it be like for them to actually live with you and see how you live out your life? Uh, not just seeing you from the outside. And when I was in Bible college, I had a pastor uh, who said, you need to, to come live with us this summer, mow my grass. Well, that was part of the deal, but uh, work at the factory down the street so you can earn money for college so you don't go into debt. That was all very wise. But one of the things that I learned from him was really a balance in ministry because, uh, I mean, we would go to church, he would preach, we would go home. And so you know how, like, all of you talk about pastor and the sermon when you go home in the afternoon? Well, we, we did the same thing, but I lived with the pastor. So, I mean, we talked about his sermon. And uh, one time we had a visitor. And it was a small church. It was a, uh, not a terribly small town. And it was like 10,000 people in, in central, north central Wisconsin. And, uh, but the church was kind of small. 
And, uh, uh, but we were growing. The church was growing. And, and so this woman visited, first time she had ever visited. And there were, weren't too many seats. She, she sat way in the back, kind of came in late and left right away. And uh, so the conversation was kind of like this on the way home. The, uh, I think one of the kids said, did, did you see the, um, the visitor who was sitting in the back today? And the, the woman? And the, the pastor's wife said, the woman who wasn't really wearing much of a dress? <laughs> And, uh, and the pastor said, um, he said, well, I don't know who she was. I didn't get a chance to meet her. But I do know women. And he said, I can guarantee that if she comes back, she will look at what all the other women wore to church, and she will be dressed like them next time. Okay. Sure enough, she came back. She was in, I don't know, pants and a blazer or something. I don't know women's clothes. But anyway, she came back more dressed like the other women who were there. From that experience, that woman came to Christ over the next few weeks. Her boyfriend that she was living with at the time, and they had a small son who was like two or three. She goes home and says, you need to start coming to church with me. So he does. He comes to Christ. Over the, over the, so over the span of about six months, what? Oh. Over the span of about six months, they both come to Christ. They both get baptized, join the church, get married. And uh, all, because the pastor said, I'm not going to judge her for the way she looked. She was visiting Let's minister to her. And that stuck with me to this day. That that was his attitude about people. Let's look through the externals. Everyone has hardship in their life. Let's look through all of that and get down to what people really need. And he went through that. And again, ministered the word of God to them, discipled them, and, and that was a happy story. Doug? We went to uh, a church in Sioux Falls and there was some girls there that they had, it was, they had t-shirts on. Not that, you know, they said bad things or whatever, but the preacher from the pulpit told them not to come back looking like that. I would say that he just drove them away. Oh. You know, the sad thing about that, <clears throat> it was a Baptist church, and we were with Gene and Keith. They were looking for a church at that time. Needless to say, Keith was so upset and felt so bad for those young girls. Actually, they had t-shirts and jeans. The jeans had a little bit of hole in but he would never, never go back mm -hmm. to that church. He said, how could someone do that? That might have been the best things they ever had, that they had to wear. Right. So, yeah, we can, unfortunately, we probably think of um, questionable examples quicker than we think of good examples. But So, our responsibility is to obey our leaders and submit to them. And that can be difficult, but as we looked at before, especially 1 Timothy 4 and, and 5, and you can go back and look at those, um, the way a pastor leads... And the reason we should obey him and, and submit to him is he's ministering the word of God to us. His authority is delegated. And, um, and so when he speaks to us from the word of God, and we say, this is what's going on in my life. How do I handle this? What should I be doing? And he says, this is what the word of God teaches. We're, we're submitting to that. We're submitting to that teaching. We're obeying him, but his, his authority is delegated through the word of God. And so that's really what we're, our, we're submitting ourselves to, is the Word of God. And you can say, well, until I understand, I'm not going to do it. But, you know, sometimes we raise our children to do things first and understand later. So there is a balance there. And sometimes when it comes to spiritual things, sometimes we have to trust what our pastor tells us first. And our understanding will come later. All right, so uh, that's verse 17. And then verse 18 and 19 fit in with this because the author is, uh, is now asking for prayer. 
And it seems like our author is someone who is also full-time in ministry. So whether he's a, he's a missionary or he's an evangelist or he's a pastor. But you see in verse 18 and 19, uh, the author says, Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. So when we're praying for our pastor, we're praying for other pastors, this idea of a clear conscience is, is important. And uh, we could argue that he clarifies what, what he means by conscience here by, by the next phrase, desiring to act honorably in all things. So when you think of a clear conscience, because we use this phrase quite often, I mean, from the old King James, it sticks in our English to this day, um, that you have a clear conscience. Uh, well, what does that mean? You have a clear conscience. Your conscience is not saying you this, Okay, so your conscience isn't poking, pointing things out at you, that there are some things that you've messed, maybe messed up. Joseph. Communication between yourself and God. Okay, so if you have a clear conscience, you have open communication between yourself and God. In other words, there's, you're not trying to hide any sin or hide behind you know, something that breaks your fellowship with God. Okay, so that's a good, good point. You can't hide anything. <laughs> yeah, you can't, but we try. Yeah, we? we pick ourselves up. Yeah, Adam and Eve. Why are you hiding? Um, yeah, uh, if you are hiding, that's a good, it's a good, uh, a good indicator that you don't have a clear conscience. Uh, when we talked about, uh, we had communion today, and Pastor mentioned this in First Corinthians 11. Uh, it says to examine ourselves and uh, to make sure that we are discerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Verse 27. And part of, uh, verse 28, and part of that then, that self-examination is in a way making sure our conscience is clear. I mean, that's kind of what we're doing. Uh, we're making sure that we, we aren't, uh, we don't have sin that we're trying to hide um, or anything like that. So in Hebrews uh, 13, 18, the, the idea of desiring to act honorably in all things is not taking a shortcut in any way. Uh, it's standing up for what is uh, true and right, regardless of the circumstance, and being able to act honorably even in those difficult situations. Uh, and we've mentioned this in other passages, right? Uh, just because someone sins against you, it does not give you the right to sin against them. Someone cuts you off in traffic. You don't have a right to go cut them off or tailgate them or blind them with your lights. So I'm not, I don't know of any particular situations of anyone in the auditorium. But you don't, don't do that, right? Acting honorably is, in some cases, deferring to other people and just letting them 